Hello and welcome to this video series on animal health and biosecurity brought to you by Farmers Weekly. I'm Janine Ryan, the editor of Farmers Weekly. And in this series, we bring you experts in the field of animal health and biosecurity to help you make better informed decisions on your livestock concerns. My guest today is Dr. Sihle Numalo from the ARC, and she's here to talk to us about African horse sickness as well as horse flu. Welcome. Thank you. Just to start off, could you perhaps just elaborate on your role at the ARC? So I am a research veterinarian um, at the Diagnostic Virology Department um, within the ARC, and I'm also involved in the Ethics um, Committee, which um, entails um, us making sure that we have investigations that are conducted under uh, ethical standards and that the welfare of the of the animals involved in the different investigations are always um, prioritized uh, within the diagnostic services I am I am involved in some of the the lab work so in terms of testing of different diseases across the um, three um, labs within our department and also just ensuring that um, quality control standards are upheld as well so could you elaborate on what African horse sickness is and what horse flu is? I think those are probably the most sort of prominent um, diseases of horses. And certainly from my sort of experience, the most economically important. So African horse sickness is an infectious viral disease of equines. And when equines, I mean our horses, donkeys um, and zebras. And it's transported by it's transmitted by uh, Coelacoides midges. So the clinical manifestation in the horse results in um, fever, uh, alterations in functions of the respiratory system, alterations in functions of the cardiac system, or you also get a mixed form where you have alterations of both the respiratory and the circulatory system combined. Mm. And horse flu is also a viral. Um, disease of, of equines. Um, it is very contagious um, and does not require a, um, a vector to transmit it. Um, it actually thrives by horses congregating um, in close proximity and it's also um, airborne. So um, its clinical manifestation r arises as that the, um, the virus actually destroys the lining of the upper airways that actually filter out all of the impurities in the air that we breathe in. And when, when, when that layer of, of, of cells uh, within the respiratory system is wiped out, it, it becomes a perfect opportunity for secondary bacteria to settle in and, and, and cause uh, pneumonia. And why are these diseases in particular economically important? So in the case of African horse sickness, there's obviously quite a high mortality rate, um, but equine flu is, uh, doesn't have such a high mortality rate. Is that true? It's said that one racehorse supports approximately 37 jobs. And with a um, sports horses uh, competing at high levels, those horses uh, support approximately 100,000 jobs. Now, this is not considering um, the jobs that are supported by horses that are not competing at, at, at high levels. So if you take this in, into consideration, um, an illness arising from any of these two viruses affects that. And then if you put one horse out of competition or, or racing, then it's not able to support those jobs. So in terms of um, our horses as well, there's a, a, a big appetite in the international market for us to export horses, for race horses and, and endurance horses as well. So those, th those diseases, let me start with, with the African horse sickness. African horse sickness then, um, as soon as there's, a, there's a, a case that is positive within the, um, the designated free zone in the Western Cape, then therefore the country cannot export um, a horse into the international market. And then for, for equine flu, like I said, when the horses come together to compete, it spreads very quickly, especially to the susceptible um, uh, horses that are unvaccinated. 
um, yes, it does, no, does not necessarily result in, 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 in fatalities, but the problem is that it becomes a long stand. Like I said, the bacterial infection in the lungs is actually quite debilitating for the horse. So then we need to consider the horse's welfare as well um, in, 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 that, in that illness. So then you have your, your virus settling in, a secondary bacterial in, um, infection settling in after that, then that horse is out of work for the duration that it needs to recover and these periods can be prolonged. And do you see lasting side effects from a horse that's recovered from, let's say, um, horse flu? Do they tend to stay l sick after they've recovered? Do they, are they able to go back to, to work or full, full performance again? So depending on the type of secondary um, infection that settles in, because then some bacteria can then spread from the lungs and settle in joints and, and, and as such, and then prolonged um, inactivity with the horse, then it takes a while for that horse to get back um, into work. And I think the more, uh, the more significant thing for, for equine flu is that because it spreads so rapidly, um, it can be carried across um, via the air. If horses are transported in the same in the same vehicle without disinfection in between, then a, another group of horses can be um, infected. So, in essence, during um, events or competitions where large populations of horses congregate, um, you can have this devastating effects as that. Um, because of one horse that's maybe infected, maybe a little bit under the weather, but shedding the virus, then it, it becomes a, a point where the, the competition becomes a point where the, the virus can be distributed to the different areas. So AHS, is it a controlled or a notifiable disease? So African horse sickness is a controlled um, disease. And horse flu, is that, does that fall under either of those categories? It is also a, a controlled disease as well. So AHS and equine flu are both controlled diseases, but I think there are, there's some confusion sometimes about the difference between controlled and notifiable diseases. Could you perhaps just elaborate on what those differences are? For diseases that do not usually occur within the borders of South Africa, and they are diagnosed. In terms of the notifiable diseases, um, the state needs to be informed about the presence of those diseases, whether the case is a still a suspect case or the, the disease has been confirmed. And then in terms of controlled diseases, specific legislation needs to be applied to ensure um, that general or specific measures are put into place to contain and prevent the, f the further spread of such diseases. So in both those cases, the state veterinarian has to be made aware of a suspected case. That's correct. So if you have a suspected case of HS or equine flu, what process should you follow? What are the first steps to take? Well, firstly is to contact your local veterinarian um, so that they come out and evaluate the horse if there is a uh, suspicion of African horse sickness, blood samples can be collected and submitted to the lab. And therefore, if the horse is clinically um, affected, supportive treatment for that specific horse um, is given. That horse can be stabled, especially between dawn and dusk, um, in a insect-proof um, stable where you you're trying to prevent the midges from coming in and biting the infected horses and then subsequently then spreading it to the rest of, of the herd. And for those horses that are in the same premises or in the vicinity, it becomes important to do daily temperature um, monitoring, especially it, it helps if it's done twice a day so that you can monitor for temperature spikes and then the, the vet can also be notified and inter, intervene uh, appropriately within that. And as we mentioned earlier that the African horse sickness virus can affect um, the lungs and, and the heart, it becomes very important not to stress these animals because those systems are already compromised. 
therefore movement, um, transporting and loading and transporting over um, prolonged distances uh, becomes not advisable for those animals. Rather get your, your, your local vet to come in and actually offer the supportive treatment um, from home. And also this helps to prevent the spread because now you could take an infected horse that has virus circulating within its system, move it to a remote location and midges in that location subsequently then pick up the virus and spread it um, to other horses. In terms of equine flu, um, isolation of the, um, the suspected or confirmed case it becomes very important. Uh, I outlined earlier that it is highly contagious. Um, the animals in the same sort of farm setting or within the vicinity should be kept in a, in a separate area. If resources allow, you have separate personnel attending to the suspect or confirmed cases versus um, animals that are not affected. Also, daily temperature um, monitoring becomes beneficial in that case. If a person is going to be handling the, the affected horses, uh, protective clothing becomes um, very important and sanitization of hands and equipment when moving between the two facilities becomes um, important as well. In the case where there's a secondary uh, bacterial in, in, in infection, um, then vigorous treatment will need to be given by the, by the local vet and um, yeah, proper care just to ensure uh, welfare is maintained for both horses that are affected with either African horse sickness or equine flu. So isolation of the infected horse or possibly infected horse from the rest of the herd seems to be the sort of common thread between the management of both those diseases. That, that's correct. And also um, just to emphasize on the insect proof stabling um, for the African horse sickness horse because of the nature and the activity of, of the midges between dawn and dusk. So in that regard then, how could farmers or horse owners prevent or try to prevent their horses from getting infected with, with these diseases? So African horse sickness has a vaccine uh, comprising of two vials that need to be given at least 21 days apart. Um, it is advised that the vaccine is given between um, the 1st of June and the 31st of October. It's important that we adhere to this time period at, as this is the time when there is no to minimal midge activity. And this is important because we do not want the strain in the vaccine to mix with the strain in the wild and therefore having the midges spread that. Um, that's why we try to adhere to the, to the drier um, seasons and we try to we aim to get the vaccine before the rainy season and there's midges that are out and highly active. For equine flu, the same applies. We've got a vaccine um, that needs to be given. And some people can get discouraged over the years in that they give the vaccines for a very long time without an occurrence of equine influenza and then they decide to stop. But the viruses, the wild viruses that are circulating are constantly mutating and changing Hence, um, industry is always doing research and actually modifying the components of the vaccine to ensure that horses um, worldwide get the most current cocktail of, 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 of vaccine, therefore having sufficient protection for whatever is circulating um, out there. And are there other measures that farmers can take? So, for example, you were mentioning earlier about stabling an infected AHS horse from dusk to dawn. Um, is that a, an effective prevention strategy as well? It is a, um, an effective prevention strategy. So I know some, some stabling have some mesh screening. So just ensuring that the pore sizes of the mesh are small enough uh, that midges cannot pass through. Alternatively, there are some um, screens or mesh that is treated um, against um, midges so that midges cannot penetrate. So there'll be um, 
DEET applied on those um, meshes or impregnated into that mesh so that midges cannot come through. Um, for equine flu, like I said, the importance of, even if your, your horse is vaccinated, where horses are congregating at shows, at competitions and whatnot, try as much as possible to minimize um, interaction with, 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 with other horses. Um, having equipment that's specific for each horse to prevent spread through sharing of equipment with the horses, ensuring that biosecurity is actually even maintained, um, even outside of, of the confines of a stable or, or your resident farm or wherever the horse is kept um, to prevent, because you'll never know um, the status of the other horses that mm. come in, 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 in into that space. But I know that the the competitions are very strict about the, um, the vaccination status and the vaccines being up to date, administered by um, a registered vet and maintaining the cold chain of those vaccines to ensure sufficient protection of those horses against those um, diseases. So does that mean also to limit contact uh, between strangers and your horse? in terms of equine flu? Definitely, definitely. And finally, is there any ongoing research in terms of diagnostics when it comes to either of these diseases at the ARC? Currently, we are looking to um, investigate technologies that will aid in a quicker turnaround time for samples that are submitted for testing. The quicker we can diagnose um, the disease, the quicker the, the vet, the attending vet can get the result and the quicker prevention of further spread um, can be implemented um, at the ground level. Thank you very much for joining me. You're welcome. Thank you. And thank you for watching this episode on animal health and biosecurity. Happy farming.